the sort of savior complex of our sector, that type of martyrdom syndrome is starting to wear off. There were a lot of executives and founders that, you know, sort of lifted their gaze and realized that nobody wanted their jobs because they had put so much into that at the sacrifice of their health and well-being and so many other areas of their life that nobody was standing in line for that baton. Hey, I'm Tanya Bhattacharya, and you are listening to the Campfire Circle podcast. We are all about breaking down the boardroom table as the ultimate space of leadership and instead replacing it with a campfire because that's where we share our stories. That's where we build warm community. And that is where there's always room. I'm building an impactful business in public through thought leadership, and I'm taking you behind the scenes all along the way. So if you want to stand out as you stand up for your mission, you are in the right place. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this special summer series of the Campfire Circle podcast. We are bringing back many moments from past episodes that are just as relevant today, if not more so. So this episode is from a longer conversation with my friend Isla Malik, who is a lawyer, a nonprofit executive, and the founder of Venture Leadership Consulting a management consulting firm that works with nonprofits to close systemic gaps of inequity. So in this little mini conversation, we are diving into something really close to my heart, which is how our personal experiences shape our nonprofit work. So if you are part of a social impact executive team or in the nonprofit world in any capacity, this episode may be really relevant for you. A lot of us got into this work because of something in our past, something in our lived experience. And maybe it was a personal struggle with mental health issues. Maybe it was growing up in a challenging environment. And so often these personal experiences drive our passion for making a difference, but they also bring their own set of challenges as we figure out how to all work together and grow and evolve our workplaces with these individual histories. After all, our interpersonal experiences ripple out and influence the culture of our organization, right? So we are talking about the savior complex that so many of us in the nonprofit sector are struggling with, that feeling of needing to do it all, to fix everything, often at the expense of our own well-being, which can, of course, lead to burnout. And it is something we need to address head on as we work to shape change as thought leaders. So I hope you enjoy this mini episode. And there's another kind of angle I want to attack this at in terms of, you know, the work that you do, which is really systemic change, change management with nonprofits, which is an experience that I know you and I also share, which is that piece around, how do I want to say this? This piece around, you know, mental health, addiction, substance use disorder, and growing up as a parentified child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to just kind of lead into this by saying, I think addiction is hugely misunderstood and severely underplayed. You know, I never personally had that allergy to drugs and alcohol that so many do, but the behaviors that show up for me are overwork, perfectionism, you know, codependency. And I think so many of us who flock to social impact work and nonprofit work had something happen to us in either in our childhood or in our lineage that caused us to have this parentification, this like savior, this martyrdom energy, if you will. And then when we go into the workplace, we bring on those same roles from that family of origin. And I just, do you also see this like saviorism piece happening in the nonprofit industry? Is this a big thing? 100%, 100%. And I don't even know that this is just a nonprofit industry. It's just more prevalent because you work with humans. We learn about ourselves through others, right? Through in community and through, you don't learn about yourself sitting in a box. You learn about yourself and how the interactions are, what irks you, what triggers you what brings you joy, what brings you peace. And so much of, I really believe, and I used to say this all the time when I would hire volunteers, whatever inner work you have not paid attention to or is undone will show up in your work in community because Mm. that's going to present itself for healing in some capacity in your life. And when you feel like you have worked on it, it's going to show up again to present itself for mastery, right? A double check Mm. is, is my belief. And so because the nonprofit community is one in which we are working with people in community, in our staff teams and our board teams, and then out with other people largely, that inner work shows up and presents itself in various forms again and again. 
And I think coupled with the inner work that presents, a lot of us in the sector have a very difficult and complicated relationship with conflict. Mm. And I talk about that a lot because it is the one through thread that I see in most difficult leadership structures is that somewhere in there, the leader is uncomfortable with conflict. They have not yet transformed conflict as a way to deepen relationship. Mm. They see it either as somewhere in their childhood experience as destructive or as something that was irreparable or caused a lot of pain. And so people either railroad through decisions or railroad through meetings, or they become avoidant or somewhere in the middle. And I think there's, I've I've spent a lot of years trying to reorient and pay attention to what mode I'm showing up in with respect to any kind of conflict, whether that's a decision, whether that's a debate or a full on disagreement of not just point of view, but of process and leadership with a board or with a co-executive or whatever that is. And so there, yeah, I, I fully agree. I think the sort of savior complex of our sector, that type of martyrdom syndrome is starting to wear off. There were a lot of executives and founders that, you know, sort of lifted their gaze and realized that nobody wanted their jobs because they had put so much into that at the sacrifice of their health and well-being and so many other areas of their life that nobody was standing in line for that baton. And so that old guard kind of mentality is shifting. I've seen that in the last 20 years. But what's now coming up is like, how do you do this and not burn out? How do you do this and lean in? And some of that is around how are you bringing your whole self to work around conflict, around engagement, around codependency, and check your ego constantly? Oh, that's uh, yes. First of all, I just want to say yes. And all of these stories are popping up in my brain of dear friends that I have who still work in the nonprofit field or my own experiences in the nonprofit field. And there's so many stories, right? Where it's like, you know, time to leave, you're exhausted, you've done a whole day of work. And then, you know, somebody comes in and they need something. And if they don't get that thing, you know, something bad is going to happen to a human. So of course you stay, but it's like, if you don't set up the structures and the systems in place so that you can have a healthy culture where you don't burn out, like it's just going to continue. So I know one of the things that you do which I find really interesting is you go in and you serve as an interim executive Mm -hmm. for these organizations that things are, you know, maybe they're falling apart. What I'll say is they need, they need a change. They need a change. Mm -hmm. Is there a framework or a model that you use for these types of situations that are so rife with conflict and change? Yeah, there's, there are definitely, you know, I think for us, we go into periods of of inflection for change. That could be scale and growth. That could be doubling down on impact. And it could be a full-on turnaround. The framework that we lean on, and to my knowledge, it has not been adapted for organizational development, but I use it all the time for it. And if any of your listeners want more, I'm happy to share a deck that we've made. I should probably write something up, but we use the, the Miller and Rolnick framework around substance addiction. So William Miller and... Stephen Rolnick did a back in the 80s, 80s and 90s, they started looking at how is it that we can get substance addicted individuals to change their habits, change their behavior. And they came up with motivational interviewing Mm. and motivational interviewing is widely practiced by therapists today. But when we talk about organizational change, organizations are made from people. It's about behavioral change at its core. And so we essentially use that framework to understand what stage of change is that organization in and where is that showing up? What is What organizational stage of change is the board showing up as, as the executive bench, the senior leadership team, down to your staff? And so the first thing we do is really as always is assess where people are at and find ways to align by lifting up the motivational interviewing framework says that folks that are pre-contemplative, you always start with the lowest denominator of the organization or of that group. And pre-contemplation is the lowest denominator. And that is people don't think there's a problem to change, or they may think everything else is the problem, but not them. Nothing that they're doing is the problem. They're a victim of everybody else's problems, right? That type of mentality is what we call pre-contemplative and the strategy for the intervention to move that person or that type of behavior was with high information 
and low intrusion. Low intrusion means we're not here to take your job. You're not necessarily getting fired tomorrow. You're not, right? How do you create safety so that people don't feel intruded upon? You enter with humility. You enter with a lot of listening, authentic relationship. And then high information is here's what a clear role for a case manager looks like. Here's what high-performing sexual trafficking organizations look like. Here's what high-performing, you know, carceral justice organizations look like. And so you're sharing information that people can step into and begin to see a discrepancy between where they are today and what they could be. When they start to contemplate that, you have an invitation to then drive change in the, in the organization. So that's, we were very mindful about how we enter, extremely mindful about how we enter. So can I just say, this is like a magic moment. I can't believe you actually use the stages of change Mm -hmm. model. I'm very familiar with the stages of change model and watching folks move from pre-contemplation going Mm -hmm. all the way to action, willpower, maintenance, because that is what we would use in the, because I, I come from the behavioral healthcare field mm-hmm. and that is literally what we would use to bring somebody from the depths of despair in active addiction to recovery. And the mm-hmm. fact that you use that now for organizations is so brilliant. It's so fabulous. And it makes me think of this quote, like at my old organization, we had this beautiful butterfly and there was a quote uh, across it, which is what the caterpillar calls the end of the world. The master calls a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And when you are in, (laughs) I mean, such a great quote about change, because when you are in pre-contemplation moving into contemplation, it it can feel like the end of the world. It feels like everything is falling apart in your organization, but there is something on the other side of it that is just completely transformed and and waiting and available to you. And I know you've seen that time and time again. Oh my gosh, time and time again. And and that's that's what I think is really beautiful about a change champion or someone who's guiding change is that they have the perspective to see how organizations have made it on the other side and story tell backwards and say, listen, this could be you guys. You guys get to co-create this next chapter. Let's honor however we got to this moment is all in service of this opportunity for us. So how do we sort of rally for this next phase? I love the the, the stages of change for your listeners. That, so motivational interviewing, as you know, is how you work through the stages of change. Prochaska, people Google tr- Prochaska stages of change, which came out in the 70s, well before Miller and Rolnick, Rolnick, they'll be able to see the stage that you just mentioned that is now pictographed in like steps and lines and circles and all kinds of things. Yeah. But that's literally the reason I started applying that was I came from case management practice, working with juvenile justice young people. And that was a framework that I started using in my practice and teaching staff and felt like, oh, I get how you help make change accessible. How do we do this in a bigger sandbox? How do we do this with systems? How do we do this with organizations? And it works. There's not a rote way, but the framework and the concept and how you think about architecting change works at all different sandboxes. And what's so beautiful about that is as you go in and you support the organization in essentially recovering, in recovering from the dysfunctional behaviors and systems, I think the people within that organization also heal themselves. They either heal or they leave because once they're in a healthy new family, right, a healthy new system, there's no space for them anymore unless they also do that work. Totally. I mean, clarity forces action, right? And I think we have to like, when we go in, we have to normalize that not everybody's interested in doing that work. And that is okay, actually. It's not a a judgment that you're not down enough or you're not social justice enough or you're not this enough. Wherever you are, you are in control of what strategy and effort you need to deploy in what domains of your life. And so if this no longer aligns because the organization has clarity, let's align people to their highest and best use and get this bus loaded for the journey that this mission needs, right? What's central to our work and central to any change initiative is the intention, which I know you are really, is really important to you in your practice, Tanya, but like maintaining your intention as the true North is what grounds the authenticity of the alignment and Mm -hmm. prevents people from feeling like all this is in service of, you know, moving this type of people out or this type of people Mm -hmm. in, right. It's, it's really about what is it that's going to serve the mission. So for us, you know, we can have the best relationships with the person who brought us in. And guess what? In face of the mission, everybody is dispensable. Even the boss that brought us in, the CEO, the board chair, like nobody is above the mission. That's what, that's who our loyalty is. Even if the funder paid for us, like we're really about 
the mission. And that helps us stay very grounded and intentional around what types and, and earn the trust of the staff and of, of leadership to, to play and do whatever we need to do. Okay, so you've heard from us. Now I want to hear from you. Leaving a review helps us so much in growing our reach and supporting more folks with this podcast. And even better, I would love for you to send me a note on LinkedIn with your takeaways from this episode. I cherish and respond to every message, so I can't wait to hear from you. And if you want to go even deeper, check out the show notes to take your next step.